Okay, this week we're looking at um, classicism. Okay, now as I said last week, each week um, essentially builds upon the previous week. And in order to, to help you, what I'm going to do at the beginning of each session will be to give you a quick recap of some of the key ideas that we looked at in the previous week. The reason I'm doing this is that hopefully you can start making the connections between the different lectures. As I said to you um, previously, the way that I am teaching this module is something like a narrative, it's like a story. So there's a kind of a beginning, a middle and an end. Now certainly criminological theory as a subject didn't develop like that, it doesn't really, didn't really have a beginning, a middle and an end, but that's how I'm going to present it to you. So before I go on then, um, I need to outline to you some of the things that we looked at very briefly last week. We looked at a few things. The first thing we looked at really was this. We asked ourselves, what is crime? A very simple question. Okay, what is crime? And we said that there's a variety of different ways of defining crime. I mean, I spent some time stealing somebody's phone and trying to explain to you that there are what we call black letter law definitions of crime. Okay, black letter law definitions of crime. And this is um, the actus reus, the... Um, the, the Latin expression, okay? Actus non facit reum, nisi men sit rea is the Latin. And that basically means there needs to be a criminal act and a criminal intention, okay, for there to be a crime. And I gave you section one of the theft act as an example. Um, so we said then that there are legal definitions. We said that we as criminologists, we find these legal definitions problematic. Can anybody remember the reason why? Anyone? Thank you, sorry? Too basic. Too basic, okay. In what way is it basic? You're absolutely right. What is it that we do then that um, black letter lawyers don't do in terms of their consideration? What's the definition that we use? What is it that we do that's different? And what we do that is different is that we understand that crime is something that happens in a context. We understand that crime is actually socially constructed. So for example, if there's no section one of the theft act, there can be no crime. Okay? Now we say then that crime is socially constructed. We, re we recognise and we acknowledge then that crime is somehow relative. It's a relative concept. Okay? It's also a contested concept as well. It's a contested concept. So we said then that crime is relative to both space and place. So what is criminal in one country, in one space, may not necessarily be criminal in another. What is criminal in um, one particular time is also, uh, may not be criminal in, in um, um, other times as well. So what's been criminal in the past? So space and place, okay, or space, I should say time actually. Time, space, and place. So crime is a contested concept. It's socially constructed. Okay, that's broadly what we looked at. We then went on to look at the uses of theory. I said to you that theory is useful. And I tried to convince you of the uses of theory. Why did I say theory was useful? Anyone remember? Why do we construct theory? Why construct theory? What's the purpose of theory? Brilliant. Okay, so we construct theory because it enables us to engage in, very loosely, the meaning of things. Okay, we'll explore this in a bit more detail in today's um, uh, seminars, but I just want to give you a quick whistle-stop tour. Okay, we went on to do one other thing, and I said to you, this is the one thing that I want you to take from today's, or last week's lecture. What was the one big thing that I was emphasising to you? Let's see if you remember. Context. That's one word, explain what you mean. You're absolutely right, context. <coughs> what did we say about context? Like to explain a theory in context, and to explain context in theory. You're a genius, right. There's an interplay between the two then, isn't there? Between, on the one hand, theory, and on the <coughs> other hand, context. That's the one big thing that we needed to remember from last week. That in order to understand theory, we must situate it 
in its context. All theory then is situated, okay? It's within a context. Understand the context, and the context tells us about the theory, okay? Good, okay. So, that's what we looked at last week. Now, what, what I'm going to illustrate to you this week in more detail is the importance, then, of theory and context. I'm going to talk about that today. We have two lectures on classicism. This is the first. This week I'm going to be talking about the context. I'm really going to be mentioning very little about classicism, oddly enough. And next week we're going to be making the connections. Okay, so today is about laying the foundations to your understanding about context, the context in which classicism emerges. Okay, so we're going to do a few things then. Firstly, this week we're going to be looking at the origins of classicism. Okay, that's really what we're going to be doing, looking at the origins of the classical perspective. Next week, we're going to explore in more detail the assumptions of classicism. Okay? So we're looking at the origins of classicism, we're looking at the content. When we start to explore different subjects, we must always put them in the context then and begin to sound like a, a parallel. That's what we need to understand there. Right, now before we go on to look at this in more detail, I want to mention a few things about the module, just to emphasise something that I said last week. I said to you that one of the reasons why many of you are studying um, criminology was because of what? Can anyone remember? Why are many of you studying criminology? Sorry? The causes of crime. There's this obsession, isn't there, with the causes of crime. What are the causes of crime? Well, the theory that I'm about to outline to you in the next couple of weeks is one of the oldest theories of crime that gives us the causes of crime. Okay? So this is really the foundations then. Okay? This is, in many ways, where it all started. Okay? So let me outline to you our time frame. Right. Now, I said to you that our timeline is punctuated by one significant event, okay? and that was the Industrial Revolution. Okay? Now, obviously, you're aware that, although I've got a straight line here, we know that the, the Industrial Revolution was, um, was, a, it was a movement, wasn't it? It, was a, it, was, it wasn't something that was kind of started on a Monday morning and finished on a Friday afternoon. These lines then are kind of wiggly, aren't they? Okay? But we're really talking kind of um, sort of 1750s um, to about 1830, roughly. Okay, now that time time period there could be contested, and it certainly is. I mean, Hobsbawm uses a slightly different um, time frame, but that's really the, the period that we're referring to. Why then is the Industrial Revolution such um, a, a turning point? Then I said to you that. This event, this revolution, was precisely that. It was a transformation, okay? It was a significant transformation. What changes? Well, the whole context changes. When we refer to context, can you remember, what are the key components to context? What do we mean by context? What are the different elements? How, do, how can we break context down into more meaningful bits? What's going on the Sorry? What's going on at the time? Um, so, so, yeah, we're referring to a specific time, aren't we? Okay, and in some places a specific place as well. Because the Industrial Revolution, we're talking about really in this country. I mean, the Industrial Revolution or Industrial Revolutions happened in other countries as well. But the, the main Industrial Revolution happened in this country. This was the, 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 um, the place for that in the Industrial Revolution. Um, how do we break context down then? What do we mean? We mean time and place, yes, context specifically. How do we break it down further? What are the elements of context? Social. Brilliant. Social. Economical. Political. Social. Economic. Political. Political. Cultural. Excellent. Cultural. Cultural. Right, so these, this is how we break context down then. Now, I said to you that the Industrial Revolution marks a fundamental 
transformation in the nature of social relations. A fundamental transformation in the nature of social relations. A fundamental transformation in the nature of economic relations. A fundamental transformation in the nature of political relations. A fundamental transformation in the nature of cultural relations. The context changes. Okay? Everything changes as a consequence of the Industrial Revolution. Now you're sitting there thinking, yeah, this is all well and good, Mark, but you know, what's this got to do with crime? What's this got to do with classicism? Bear with me, okay, we're going to get there. But before we can get there, we need to understand the context. Why? Because theory is always situated, okay, in the context. Understand the context, you understand the theory, okay, or you understand the, the theory better. This is the point. Right, so this is our context then. Now we're going to need to start fleshing this out to understand what are the elements. What was changing here? What was significant? The period here before the Industrial Revolution we call pre-modernity. The period after the Industrial Revolution is commonly referred to as modernity. Okay, the Industrial Revolution was the driving force for modernity then. Okay? And we said, didn't we, last week, very briefly, that there's an argument that could be had in, and is been had in, or has been had in many, many disciplines, not just criminology, but in art, in, um, in social theory, in, in terms of um, architecture, you know, a whole range of different disciplines as to whether or not we're witnessing another transformation, a kind of um, a technological revolution. Okay? In which case, you know, some argue that we're moving towards late modernity, and others says no, this transformation has already occurred, in which case relations now are based on post-modernity. So again, a fundamental transformation in nature of social relations. You know, are we witnessing that at the moment? Okay, we don't want to worry too much about that, but I just want to flag that up because that's where we get to. That's where we finish in terms of this module, in terms of looking at um, theories that are developed now, and how they are also um, put into a context, how they're also informed by a context. So we've got pre-modernity and modernity there. Okay? We've got this shift that occurs. Okay, now it's this shift that occurs that gives us a deeper understanding of the origins of classicism. Let's not forget that's what we're talking about today, then, the origins of classicism. Let's look at this period then in pre-modernity. Okay, let's look at social, economic and political cultural relations before the Industrial Revolution. Let's, let's think about how things um, were structured, how they were organised. If we look at society, okay, society, society in pre-modernity then, before the Industrial Revolution, was highly stratified. Okay? There were very distinct classes, and those distinct classes were very rigid. So at the top, you had the monarch. Okay? You had the king or the queen. Then, below the king or the queen, you had the um, aristocracy. Okay? Family members of the monarch, or people that had the king or queen's patronage. And then below, below that, you had basically the rest of us, the plebs, okay? the serfs. Many people were tied to land as well. They were tied to land owners. Now, there was no movement between these different classes then. Okay? Not like we know today where somebody can be born into a working class background and win the national lottery and suddenly become very, very wealthy and, and, and kind of move into a different class. This was highly stratified, highly rigid. Okay? Now, this bring, the Industrial Revolu Revolution changes this. Okay? We're going to come to that in a moment, okay? but that's just a precursor, just bear this in mind. So this change, then, social relations change. Right, let's explore this a bit more in a bit more detail. The monarch. The monarch has, or had, absolute power. Okay? The monarch had unfettered power. The, the monarch could essentially do what they wanted to do. Okay? They had absolute unfettered power. Who gave the monarch this power? Well, God gave them the power because they ruled by divine right. 
It used to be believed that the monarch was given their power, given their authority by God. God chose them. And in, in, in this period here, and many, many years before this, it used to be believed that God's, um, sorry, that, uh, that the monarchs, the kings, the queens were actually gods. Okay? But during this period, then, it was believed that the monarch ruled um, by divine right. They were put in their position because God wanted them there. Okay? So what did this mean then in terms of the way they um, administered this power? Well, they could do whatever they wanted. Okay? If you wanted to trade, you would need to get the monarch's permission. Okay? Everything came through the monarch. Okay? So the monarch would um, um, give power to the aristocracy and they could then administer the king's will. Okay? So it was all very rigid, all very stratified. And this worked very well for a number of centuries. Okay? But this, this changes everything. Let's have a look again at what was happening in this period here then. So the monarch had absolute power given to them by God and they were ruled by divine right. Let's start looking now then at the criminal justice system. What was the character of the criminal justice system during this period? What, what sort of forms of punishment were there? Can anybody think? Arbitrary. Sorry? Arbitrary. Arbitrary, brilliant, excellent. You've done some reading, haven't you? Good, it shows. Brilliant. Okay, so power was administered in an arbitrary way then. So, for example, you could be um, um, given cap capital or corporal punishment for very different offences. So, you might be given, you might be flogged for stealing, you might be hung for stealing. Okay? There was during this period something that was called, and it's quite apt that I'm using a red pen, the bloody code. There were dozens of offences whereby the offence for, uh, sorry, the punishment for committing certain offences was death, okay, the bloody code. So this period then, not only did punishment tend to, tend to be arbitrary, it also tended to be very punitive as well. Okay? Why? What was the source of that punitiveness then? Why did it appear that this particular type, these types of punishments, capital and corporal punishment, why were they particularly punitive? <coughs> Can anybody think? And it comes from this. It comes from the source of power. Why did the punishments during this period tend to be particularly punitive, particularly brutal? And this is a key word, brutal. Why were they particularly brutal? Think, think about this, the relationship between the monarch and their authority. Excellent. You've done some reading as well. Brilliant. Go on, explain what you mean. Religion. Religion is important. So that's... Because, because you're a genius, you get your very own black comic. There you go. Religion in black. Right. Religion is central to this. You're absolutely right. This is important as well, isn't it? So why did a punishment tend to be very brutal there? What's the importance of religion here? You're a genius too. Exactly. Not only when you break the law, not only are you breaking the monarch's law, but you're also breaking God's law as well, aren't you? So you're almost committing two offences rolled into one. Because the, because the monarch makes the law, and the monarch is given their power by God. So not only have you gone against God's law, but you've gone against the monarch's law as well. So therefore, punishments tended to be very brutal. They tended to be very barbaric, okay? So, punitive, brutal, and barbaric. Or what we consider to be barbaric, anyway. There is, and I invite you to look at this, there's a book by Michel Foucault. F-O-U-C-A-U-L-T. <coughs> Michel Foucault, called Discipline and Punish. In the very first chapter of uh, Michel Foucault's Discipline and Punish, um, Foucault describes 
the um, execution of a would-be regicide, somebody that wanted to kill the monarch. They didn't actually get away with it, they were caught. Um, and so Michel Foucault then, he describes what happened. Now Damien was his name. Damien was this guy that wanted to kill the monarch. Um, and what happened is, is that he was hung, drawn and quartered. Now you're all familiar with this, this, this expression, being hung, drawn and quartered, but do you actually mean, know what it actually means in real terms? Hung, drawn and quartered. What would happen is, is the individual would be hung, okay? Now sometimes the hanging would do them in, and other times it wouldn't. Um, what would then happen is, is the person would be taken down from the gallows. The hanging, by the way, takes place in public. It's a big spectacle. Now some of us go to watch an Arsenal play on a Saturday afternoon. In, these period, in this period here, um, punishment was a form of entertainment. People would all gather around in the, in the market square and they would be like a baying crowd. They would be there to watch this spectacle. So they were hung. Then they were drawn. What this meant is, is their stomach would be cut, an incision would be made in their stomach, and their intestines would be drawn. Okay, you imagine the gruesome nature of this, the brutal nature of this. And so the intestines, the intestines are very, very long. So the intestines would be drawn, okay, and they'd be flayed out in front of this person. And then if that wasn't enough, they would be quartered, which meant that the individual, in this case Damien's, the would-be regicide, he was splayed out on the floor, and um, a little bit like me, they would have um, ligatures put onto their arms, both arms, and in both legs, and they'd be in like this kind of starfish shape, and they'd be sort of on the floor, and attached to each arm would be a horse. Okay, so you've got something like this. It's an excuse for me to do one of my really bad drawings. Okay, so you've got a horse, there's, oh, I can't even, I wouldn't even attempt to draw a horse. That's a horse, that's a horse, that's a horse, okay. Um, and then what would happen is, is that one of the executioners would, would crack his whip, and these horses would bowl, okay? Which basically meant that the arms and the legs would be pulled off, okay? Wow, imagine that as a spectacle, okay? Now, in this particular case, Michel Foucault says that what happened is, is that one of these horses, this one here, was a bit dumb, and that wasn't really trained in pulling, and what happened is these ones managed to pull the arms and legs, but this one didn't, so the executioner, you had to get in there with an ax and start chopping away at the leg. Really brutal, really gruesome then, okay? This was the character of justice during this period. It was very public. It was a public spectacle, okay? So, this is what happened then during this period then. You had these very brutal forms of punishment that were arbitrary. They didn't seem to have much sense to them. Or to use another word, and this word's really important, it didn't seem to actually accord to reason. Okay, we'll come back to that word in a moment. What else was happening during this period then? We're really trying to set the scene here then. So we've already said then that religion um, is, has a central role to play. Let's look at the nature of social relations during this period then. Here you would find that you would have small communities. Okay. Sometimes you might have slightly bigger communities. But all of these little communities then would largely be self-sufficient. Okay? Anything you want, you could get from your local community. Okay? So let's zoom into this little community here. Okay? So there's a little community. In this community, pretty much everyone in the community you would know. Okay? And many of them would actually be members of your own family. Okay? So these were very tight-knit, homogenous, homogenous communities. There was a higher degree of resemblance amongst the communities. Okay? Now, there wouldn't be a great deal of movement. Um, you might find that you know, occasionally somebody might go to this community here to do a bit of trade for that community there, but it was all fairly local. Okay? There wasn't a great deal of movement. You would st obviously, there, were, there was kind of movement, but it was pretty much, you know, you were you, you're brought up in one community, you lived in that community, and you died in that community. Okay? So these communities then were not only homogenous, but they were also self-supporting. So there wasn't a great deal of movement. Okay? So that's some of the background then in terms of pre-modernity. Okay, now sounds like a history lesson this, doesn't it? Okay? This is the context. 
It will all fit in next week. Everything will kind of slot into place next week. So bear with me so far. Right, so the Industrial Revolution. That's how things were ordered in pre-modernity. We've gone on, we need to go on to explain what happens in modernity. But let's try to understand the driving force of this. What was the Industrial Revolution? What <coughs> drove this change? What drove this transformation? What drove this significant shift? What changed? What was the driving force? What things were happening? When we talk about the Industrial Revolution, what comes to mind? Think of what comes to mind. Shipping. Sorry? Shipping. Shipping? Yeah. Explain what you mean. Well, we've got like the fusion of like these engines where they all go to like all these different countries and slaves were like being served, they started from the shipping. Say that again so I didn't hear the like last bit. Ships, Right, this slavery, slavery has been abolished by the time we get to this period here. Slavery was happening in this period here. Um, so, you know, it's this period here, there, there is lots of shipping going on, but the ships are doing one particular thing. What are the ships doing? They're not just travelling, they're not, they're not going on an 1830 to Ibiza, are they? What are they doing? Transferring goods. They're transferring goods, they're trading, aren't they? They're trading. Okay, what are they trading? What are they trading? They're bringing resources back to the motherland in order to manufacture. Okay? So what's happening is then is the trade is something that fuels the Industrial Revolution. So you, you, you need raw materials, don't you? For, to, to have a, an Industrial Revolution, you need the raw materials to, to actually fuel that there. So here we go, there's a little ship. Okay, so the ship is basically bringing goods for the industrial area. It's bringing the raw materials. It's bringing the coal. Um, obviously, coal is also located in this country as well. It's one of the reasons why the industrial revolution um, was able to was able to start. But you're also trading, then, aren't you? You're, 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 the, the goods that are being manufactured in the industrial revolution are also being traded with other countries in return. So trade starts to pick up. Okay? But the Industrial Revolution was triggered by this, industry, technology. For the first time then, we begin to see the development of machinery, technology. So here then, in pre-modernity, you, know, you might have one person, uh, that isn't a horse, that's a plough okay, on the field. Um, <laughs> to suspend your imagination slightly, or extend your imagination. Um, so rather than having um, several people um, with a plough and a horse, plough and a field, you can have machinery that would do that for you. Okay? So technology, industry begins to develop and begins to um, do the jobs that 10, 15, 20, 30 men would do. Okay? This mean, then means that uh, manufacturing becomes much more efficient, much more effective, and what happens as a consequence of that then? is that profits increase. Profits increase. So, the Industrial Revolution then is kick-started by this, this, this explosion of industry. New um, technologies that are designed to make things easier. To, to produce and manufacture quicker. So here then you've got, you've got things like the canals being built. The canals were being built in order to be able to trans transport goods from one end of the country to another, trans um, transporting coal to um, other parts of the country that needed the coal to burn in order to um, 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 power machinery. Okay? And then you had um, the, the, the rail network, the trains um, are being introduced. These were a much quicker way of transporting goods. So <coughs> technology then begins to provide lots of answers. Okay? It, it begins to develop this new way of structuring relations. Okay, so the Industrial Revolution then is changing things. Okay? These communities then, these small, tight-knit communities begin to change. How, do, how, do, how does this change then? 
How, how does people's living um, conditions change as a consequence? Are people still living in these small rural communities? No, they're not. They're not living in rural communities, they're living in urban communities, aren't they? So we go from this, these small, tight-knit, um, homogenous communities, to the metropolis, to the city. We begin to get then these big urban developments. So we always have places like London, for example, but it begins to change. It begins to get much more dense. What's the driving force between that then, or behind that? Behind this to this? How do we get from that to that? What causes that? What causes that to happen, this change in living relations in terms of these rural to urban? Economic? You're absolutely right. What in particular? What economic factors specifically? You're absolutely right. Jobs. Jobs. Okay, go back a step. So what would you mean? So jobs. Oh, let's stick with jobs. What's happened here then? What's happened to the jobs here? Because obviously the like They've gone, haven't they? Technology has replaced them. So what happens is is that lots of people find themselves out of work because of technology. Go back and look at the history books and you'll see things like um, Captain Swing. It sounds like a porn star, but Captain Swing <laughs> isn't a porn star. Captain Swing was a movement, a social movement, whereby um, individuals were threatening to uh, smash up machinery. They were saying, you know, unless you uh, get rid of this machinery, we're going to burn this factory down. Okay, you had other movements as well. Um, but there was huge discontent by this revolution, or because of this revolution, because of the unemployment that this caused. So people were gravitating towards these new urban enclaves, because this is where the employment was. People were literally starving in their thousands. So they were going where the employment was, where the factories were, where this industry was located. So people then begin to move from these um, homogenous communities to these heterogeneous communities. Heterogeneous communities. Here, these homogenous communities then, everything, there's a high degree of light because these seem very um, similar. In these heterogeneous communities, these are characterised by this. Diversity, they're very different. Imagine, here, in this little community here, where you know everyone, and many people you're related to, okay? Um, you know, there, there's this very ordered sense of social relations where everyone kind of knows their place. To this, what are these places going to be like then? Imagine, imagine that you're, you know, you're brought up in a very small rural community where everyone knows each other, and then you're forced from this into this. What are these places like? Think of Dickensian Britain. What's the character of these metropolises? What, what, is, what, is, what, what, what are they like? Are they nice places? No, they're not treated as nicely as they would have been with when everyone knew them in the community. Right, these places then are scary, aren't they? You don't know anyone. So everyone seems to be a stranger, everyone seems to be a threat as well. So people begin to get scared then, don't they? And these places then um, are, are you, you kind of typical inner city slums in many ways. So, you know, think about, you know, literally, um, there was one particular summer when famously Parliament was unable to sit because the River Thames actually stunk so much of piss and shit that people couldn't actually sit in Parliament, OK? You literally had rivers of piss and shit down the streets. Um, because there was no sanitation. Imagine the, you know, the, the actual stench. It used to be believed during this period that people became ill because of miasma. Um, that the, the actual disease was somehow in the air. And this is when people started going to Victorians, particularly, started to go to places like Brighton, um, you know, places by the seaside, because it was thought that the air was fresh and this was somehow healing. I mean, in many ways, they were right, but it wasn't because the diseases were being um, transmitted through the air, it's because they were actually drinking this stuff because the piss and shit was seeping into the um, drinking water and creating things like cholera and so on and so forth. So these places were filled with dirty, horrible, crowded, unpleasant places. Okay? 
Social relations begin to change during this period as well. The natural order of things begins to change. And it comes back to what you were saying earlier on about shipping and trade, specifically trade. Do you remember I said here that the monarch would give patronage? Patr oh, can't spell patronage. Okay. So they would give the power or the, um, the ability to trade to members of the aristocracy. Okay, so if you wanted to trade abroad, you would need to get the monarch's permission to do so. Okay, so if you wanted to bring tea from China, you would need to get permission to do that. Okay? Now, the natural order of things begins to change as a consequence of these changes, of, these, of this industrial revolution. Okay? Here, you basically had two classes. You had the aristocracy, and you had the serfs or the plebs, if you like. Okay? The workers. People who owned nothing. The Industrial Revolution brings about a change in this, okay? and it's, the change is brought about as a consequence of trade, the ability to trade. What happens to this? What changes the then? Middle class. The middle class. You've done some reading as well, haven't you? Brilliant. Well done. Okay, so here then, you've still got your monarch. Your monarch begins to lose some of their powers as well. Okay? You've still got the aristocracy, you've still got them today. But what you get as a consequence of the Industrial Revolution is the emergence of a middle class, a new class, a middle class, or a mercantile class. Right, now, now we're getting somewhere. Now we're getting towards what we need to be looking at, because we're looking at the origins of classicism. And the origins of classicism really start right here. Okay, this mercantile class. So, let's look at that then. Is everyone with me so far? We are. We're all doing well. I'm impressed. So, the Industrial Revolution brings about a fundamental transformation in the nature of social, economic, political and cultural relations then. It's industry that changes everything. Okay. There's other things that are happening during this period as well. Other things that are happening culturally. Let's explore some of those cultural shifts that are occurring. We noted earlier on then that these forms of punishment that were being used in pre-modernity, um, being hung, drawn and quartered, for example, okay, these capital and corporal forms of punishment, these were very public then. Okay. And we noted then that they were a spectacle. Okay, People would um, go to a local hanging on a Saturday afternoon as a form of entertainment. It brought communities together in their collective outrage of the acts that were um, conducted by these convicted um, felons, these co convicted criminals. We noted earlier on, and some of you um, were kind of turning up your noses when I was explaining they have been hung, drawn and quartered. Now, you did that for a reason. Why, why did you do that? You tell me. Some of you were, were kind of repulsed by that, weren't you? It's not normal now. It's not normal now. Not in this country. In some countries it is. Really? Yes. In some countries you've still got these, type, these types of punishment. Yes, yeah, but not that. Women being stoned for being adulteresses. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. This kind of thing. So, you know, it's not completely, you know, I'm giving you a very kind of ethnocentric um, kind of a, 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 um, outline of this. You know, this, we're talking very, very much what's happening in the West and particularly what's happening in this country and other um, European countries as well. Why do we find this so repulsive? Most of us, anyway. What's so repulsive about that? It's not socially accepted now. Why is it not socially accepted now? You're absolutely right, it isn't socially it's accepted. Really we're more civilised, aren't we? Good. You did some reading as well, didn't you? Brilliant. Those of you that have done some reading or listened to the uh, podcast that I put on, hopefully you're finding this pretty straightforward because you're familiar with most of these ideas. Um, help yourself. Do some reading in advance. You'll find it easy. Civilization. What do we mean by that then? So we seem to be more civilised. What is... What do we mean by that? More... Ethical. Now there's, there's a problematic term if ever there is one. What do we mean by ethical? And you were going to say something. You're just stretching. Okay. 
Sorry? Human rights is, is really, um, human rights, how we understand them now, is a, is a relatively modern um, con uh, conception. But certainly you had the foundations of that, um, probably you know, around out here, but you know, they kind of still existed. But what do we mean when we say that we find these, these types of punishment repulsive because we're more civilised, we have a different sense of ethics, don't we? To say we're more ethical, isn't, isn't strictly true, is it? Because ethics means you know the, the difference between right and wrong, and that changes according to the context. So you know, before 1969, um, two men having consent, consensual sex was seen as being unethical, whereas now it's seen as um, ethical, maybe, and even legal. Um, so these, what we consider to be ethical, changes, I suppose, in many ways. But what's the driving force between what we mean by being more civilized and more ethical in, the, in that lo looser sense? Why do we begin to see, why do we, we consider the, these barbaric forms of punishment as being so repulsive, so repugnant? Because they're not proportionate to the crime. Because they're not proportionate. So where did that come from? Justice. Pro pro proportionality, where's that come from? You've plucked that from somewhere. You're absolutely right. You got it from Becca Rea. Okay, right, so it's an informed point. You're absolutely right there. So this concept here of propor I'm not even right, proportionality. You made, was it you mentioned arbitrary earlier? Was it you? It was you, yeah. sorry, okay. So arbitrary. Right, these now we're beginning to mention certain concepts. So somehow proportionality, somehow um, kind of some, some certainty become important. Why? What's the driving force behind these then? You're absolutely right to mention people like Becker and Bentham begin to introduce these, but why? Why do people start looking at this system and start saying it's barbaric? Why do they look at this system and say it's repulsive and repugnant? Why are people calling for a change? What's the driving force? Sorry? You're absolutely totally on cue. Shut it up. They become enlightened. You're a genius as well. I'm going to give you a... You can have a green. Would you like green? Green? green. <laughs> enlightened. Uh, hey. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> enlightened. Right, people become enlightened, don't they? So, we have a cultural movement during this period called the Enlightenment. This is a cultural movement then. What is the Enlightenment then? You're doing everything right apart from wearing a West Ham top. <laughs> That's a bit of sorry, I apologise, I apologise. Sorry, it's similar colours anyway, isn't it? So what is the what is the enlightenment? You're absolutely right. It's a paradigm. What's a paradigm? You're right as well. So the enlightenment is an idea. Okay, here, let's just pause here for a moment. The uses of theory. I said to you right at the very beginning, didn't I? What is the purpose of developing theory? Theory helps us to engage in the meaning of things. Ideas change the world. Ideas change the world. And here's an idea that did change the world. The Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was a movement. It was a cultural movement. And it sought to do specific things. What were the things that the Enlightenment sought to do then? Can anyone tell me? Was it like, it was like an age of reason where science... Brilliant. You can have uh, you can have a blue pen. Do you like a blue pen? Yeah. Right, the age of reason. Brilliant. Okay, right. These are the key words then. The age of reason, proportionality, um, not arbitrary, but certainty. Right. Okay. The age of reason. What's the age of reason then? That people went from like thinking that faith was reason to scientific evidence. Right. So. Famously, Friedrich Nietzsche, in a book called Beyond Good and Evil, Friedrich Nietzsche is a German philosopher. He's not a criminologist, but he's mentioning this as a, as a kind of a, a sub-point. Friedrich Nietzsche, in a book called Beyond, um, Beyond Good and Evil, and another one called Thus Spake Zarathustra, he famously declared the death of God. He said, God is dead. God no longer exists. Because God had been replaced by a new way of seeing the world, a new way of ordering things. What was that new way of ordering things? Science. Science. Reason. And reason. 
What is reason then? What do we understand reason to be? Evidence. Something needs to be based on evidence. Something needs to be able to be provable then, doesn't it? Can God be proved? No, because it's based on this, isn't it? Faith. People that believe in God have faith. They don't necessarily need to have proof. It's a faith thing, isn't it? Like you have faith in God. So, why did this begin to take place then, this cultural movement? Did somebody just wake up on a Friday morning and say, you know what, God's dead? No, there's a process here, isn't there? What's the process and what was the driving forces behind this? Why did this age of reason start? Who wanted more answers? Scientists, think about what we said earlier on about where this came from, the driving force. Who was the driving force for uh, all of this? The middle classes. Good, right. So the middle classes. Right, now why do the middle classes, why do they want to see a change in the order of things? Why is it in their interest for there to be a change in the order of things? Because... To go higher, to, to better themselves. Exactly, you can have a black pen. Right, so they, um, the middle classes then are calling for this. They want greater rights, don't they? The greater rights to trade, but also greater social, economic, and political rights as well. Okay, they want a better say. They want a, a, a better say in, in, in how um, things are ordered and how things are run. So these old forms of punishment then seem to be distasteful. Okay? They are somehow um, a, a violation of this kind of deep-seated sense of what is right and what is wrong. Okay? They're seen as being repugnant. Okay? So people want to change this. They want a system that is much more proportionate and less arbitrary. Okay? And it's the middle classes that are calling from this. This big cultural movement there. Okay? Right, now. Good, we've done well there. Okay, so this is part of the context then. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this next week. But this is a good place to leave it. Because next week, we're going to start making the connections. This is the context. And we've already raised some really important points there. We've raised some of these... Um, um, points about proportionality, about it being an age of reason. How does this then, how does this context then inform this theory, i.e. classicism? What's the link between all of this and classicism? Okay, so we've got kind of part one of the story here. Next week I'm going to give you part two and we're going to start looking at how this, all of this, all of this context links in to the theory. Understand this, and it tells us about the theory. Okay? Okay, that's, um, that's where we're going to finish today then.